for as well. Well, good morning, Cornerstone. Uh, we are uh, in our series in the book of Joshua. And uh, the book of Joshua tells a story, mainly the story of how Israel, um, they are now ready to conquer Canaan, conquer the promised land. And we've seen how um, they started on the uh, east side of the Jordan. They took a number of uh, areas, and then now they miraculously cross the Jordan, and then now they just take over this whole region that God has promised them. And so that's the story so far. Today we're going to look at Caleb, and um, kind of more of a character study. We've been kind of covering kind of a history, what's been going on. But today we're going to look at Caleb, and um, if you're familiar with him a little bit, his story, we start hearing about him in Numbers uh, 13 to 14, where we, uh, we hear about the spies that go into the land. So uh, 12 spies, one for each tribe, goes into the land, right? When they're ready to come out of the desert, and they're ready to enter the promised land. And Caleb and Joshua are the two that come back with a favorable report, right? They say, you know, this, that land that God said is going to be this great, bountiful land that we're going to enjoy. It is, it is crazy you know, great, but, right, the other people said, but there's these um, lot of people <laughs> that we're going to have to take out. There's these fortified cities. And so the rest of the spies, um, you know, said, man, we can't do this. And so the people turn against the leaders, right? Joshua and Caleb stand strong, but the rest of them, they basically rebel against God. And unfortunately, then they face God's judgment. Right, God said, okay, you want to go back to the desert, you know, go back to the desert. And he's going to send them to the desert for 40 years. So they wandered to the desert for 40 years because of their disobedience. And that everyone in that generation, everyone 20 years of age and older, would pass away and not get to see the promised land. And then all we really have, right, so Joshua and Caleb are these two old guys, basically, only ones left in their generation and now, um, now they have got to see the promised land. They got to conquer the land. And so we fast forward. Now it's 45 years after that initial um, going into the land. They've taken the land. It took, took them about five years to get where they are. And now they're ready to divide up the land. And so Caleb enters the story even more. And what we'll see is that Caleb, even though he is 85, he's 85 years young at this time. And most people, I think we would like to stay young, right? It's kind of this thing, not just our culture, but for sure in our culture, right? Plastic surgery, um, a lot of us try to stay fit, maybe. Um, we try to eat well. A lot of us, if we, if we had a choice, we would like to stay young, right? We'd like to stay vital, um, physically, mentally, everything, right? And um, if we could do it, we would. There's this... Um, we're not the only culture that has had that desire, right? There's this uh, myth of the fountain of youth, right? Have you guys heard of fountain of youth? So the myth is that there's a spring of water somewhere in the world that, uh, or, or numerous places in the world that if you drank from it or you bathed in it, you would be young, right? And so um, it, it's been, you know, I've read a little bit of the history of it. There's a number of different time periods where people actually thought they were going to find it. Right? And even, um, if you guys know Ponce de Leon, I like saying his name, Ponce de Leon. It's a cool name. But he came to Florida, and he didn't say he was looking for it, but they even attached the myth that he was coming, looking for the fountain of youth, and he found Florida. <laughs> a consolation prize. Um, but here's a, here's a quote about the fountain from someone. They said, A frail old man could so completely be restored that he could resume all manly exercises. Take a new wife and beget more children. <laughs> okay, that was, that was one of the goals of people searching for that. Well, I have, a, I have a secret for you if you promise not to tell anyone, and that is I have discovered the fountain of youth, right? Can't you tell? Like, <laughs> through the fountain of youth, I became a youth pastor at 45 years old. You guys never connected that, did you? Um, my wife, she started running half marathons after she turned 40, right? And so we have discovered it. And so since you are my church family, I decided to share it with you. Um, and the source of it is right here in the Bible. Okay, so why don't you rise with me? We're going to look at Joshua chapter 14. 
verses 6 to 15. And we'll see, and we'll look at this, and we'll just see what God has done in uh, Joshua's life, I mean, in Caleb's life. Now the people of Judah approached Joshua at Gilgal, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said to him, You know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, at Canish Barnea about you and me. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of God, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to explore the land. And I brought him back a report according to my convictions. But my fellow Israelites who went up with me made the hearts of the people melt in fear. I, however, follow the Lord my God wholeheartedly. So on that day, Moses swore to me, the land on which your feet have walked will be your inheritance and that of your children forever because you have followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. Now then, just as the Lord promised, he has kept me alive for 45 years since the time he said this to Moses while Israel moved about in the wilderness. So here I am today, 85 years old. I am still as strong today as the day Moses sent me out. I am just as vigorous to go out to battle now as I was then. Now, give me this hill country that the Lord promised me that day. You yourself heard then that the Anakites were there, and their cities were large and fortified. But the Lord helping me, I will drive them out just as he said. Verse 13. Then Joshua blessed Caleb, son of Jephunneh, and gave him Hebron as his inheritance. So Hebron has belonged to Caleb, son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, ever since, because he followed the Lord, the God of Israel, wholeheartedly. Hebron used to be called Kiriath Arba, after Arba, who was the greatest man among the Anakites. Then the land had rest from war. Let me pray and we'll have a seat after. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you uh, that you speak and um, that you reveal your truths to us. I just pray right now, Lord, that, um, yeah, that you would um, just make your truths evident to us, that you would share with us about Caleb and how we can learn from him uh, and just his heart for you. We thank you, Lord. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, please have a seat. Okay, so Caleb, he was 85, as we've said, and he, was just, he said he was just as strong as when he was 40, Okay. And when I read this passage, I thought of a number of, you know, people that are older and have carried through. And I, and I thought of this one video that I've kind of enjoyed. So let me queue up a little video for you to watch. Um, it's called Uncle Drew. If some of you are already familiar with it, it was kind of an advertising, advertising for Pepsi. But I, I found it fun, and it, I think it, it connects with what we're doing today. So go ahead and run that. I'm a real ball. I came up during the real time, watching the big O, watching Wilt, watching real balls. Get buckets. I get buckets. These young balls out here got all the sheet headphones and all this rapidy hippity hop, all these flashy shoes. These guys don't practice the fundamentals anymore. It's good that they can come out here and play some basketball. And it's cold weather. Oh my gosh. Come in. Don't play around with these kids, man. For real. Got you, Uncle Drew. You could be good if you took the game serious. Oh, yeah. Uh huh. Oh! You okay? Good. Yo, we need, we need another player. Yo, I think my Uncle Drew could play. I'm not playing. Uncle Drew, you can play? You better stop playing around. Come on, Uncle Drew. We need you, man. Come on. All right, man. What do you want me to take? Man, just get the smallest person on the court. He's, he's really I got slow. Him. I got, him. got your help. Oh, shit. We here, we here. Oh. Scream, 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 scream. Scream me. Scream me. You okay? Yeah, I'm good. Show him something, man. Yeah. Back, boy. I'll get Drew. Hey, hey, hey. Yo, what the? Head's not in the game. I don't know where it is. Come on. 
got your help, Sajid. Oh, just oh, still. Push it, push it. Push it, old man. There you go. Play in position. I got you all right. Oh. 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 There it is. That's what you do. You still got skills. Knock it down, Uncle Drew. Hey. Hey. Uh oh. Hey. Oh. 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 I know I'm old, young blood, but you want to switch sneakers? <laughs> you sure you don't want to switch? Hey. Really hilarious. My boys like watching it. Um, but he was old, right? But in the end, after you know, kind of loosened up a little bit, he was you know as vigorous as obviously you know the younger guys on the court there. And I don't think it was because he drank Pepsi, right? <laughs> that was his secret. Um, but he did, you know, in a way, there's some kind of secret, I think, that Caleb will reveal to us, is that how could somebody 85 years old, right, when you think about um, that age, and yet he was a leader in, the, in his nation, and he was able to express this, um, this uh, vigorousness, this is seemingly, we talk about this physical part, but I think we're going to talk more of the spiritual part, that he was... Um, just as strong when he first started, all the way through, okay? And I'm sure it was even to the day he died that he was this person. So what was his secret? Well, one was that he understood that following God meant following him wholeheartedly. So at times in our history, in the Christian faith, I think there's been, um, sometimes we, we see a little bit lesser level of commitment to the Lord, where... Um, people end up settling for something less than what God intended. So if we look at, like, Deuteronomy 6, 4 to 5, it says this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. Right? This is a, a very uh, popular verse, and it expresses what God expects, what God says, this is what it means to follow me. It means to love me with your all. Right? It means a full commitment. There's no half. It's either you're in or you're out. Okay? If we look at Joshua, so if we look at that passage that we have today, verses 6 to 15, three times in this passage he repeats a particular word when he refers to Caleb. So let's, I'm going to reread verses 8, 9, and 14. Verse 8. He said, but my fellow Israelites who went up with me made the hearts of the people melt in fear. I, however, followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. Verse 9, so on that day Moses swore to me, the land on which your feet have walked will be your inheritance and that of your children forever because you have followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. Verse 14, so Hebron has belonged to Caleb son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, ever since, because he followed the Lord, the God of Israel, wholeheartedly. So as we study scripture, whenever they repeat a word, it usually is trying to point our attention to something, right? And this time, they repeat a word three times, well, it's mentioned three times, right? And so I think the focus, God is trying to focus us in on Caleb and that this is essential a part of who he was. He wholeheartedly follow the Lord. I think if, to me, it's almost like synonymous. Actually, his name, Caleb, actually means dog, which is interesting. But to me, if you, if you look at Caleb, you, I think if I think of him from now on, I'm always going to think of wholehearted. He was wholeheartedly following the Lord. If you search, even if you search in the Bible, I kind of sort of say, well, maybe other people got referred to that way in the Bible. So I, looked, I searched the word follow, um, wholehearted, and Lord together. And it only appears five times in the Bible, and all five have to do with Caleb. And so, um, 
his life represents that to us. And Jesus said the same thing, right? He says, you want to follow me? It's going to, it's going to cost you. It's going to be a, it requires a full commitment. Right? We just look at the cross. It's a full commitment. Uh, many Christians believe, well, many people believe they are Christians, and maybe they are not. Maybe some of us even in this room think, well, you know, I, you know, I, I think I follow Jesus, but, you know, do you really, right? And I'm not talking about um, works, right, that, oh, man, if I'm the best person, I'm, you know, I'm talking more about commitment, right? In our hearts, is that our desire, is it our commitment that we will follow the Lord for the rest of our lives the best we can? Sometimes when we share the gospel, we maybe end with, well, if you Place your faith and trust in Jesus. You have, you know, you have an eternal relationship with him. But I think it has to end more with, that's obviously part of it, but it has to end with, will you follow him? Right? Will you make a decision in your heart, in your will, to follow him as best you can all the days of your life? Right? And so I'm not saying, you know, we have to be perfect, right? Because no one will be. And I'm not saying that it's something, obviously, that we can earn. And it's not saying that we will never have doubts or we won't have ups and downs. But is it our commitment? Have we made that commitment in our hearts to follow him wholeheartedly as best we can? So that is uh, one thing that Caleb reveals to us, that we um, following God means following him wholeheartedly. Okay, we cannot just say I follow God if we don't mean we will do it wholeheartedly. And when we follow God with our all, we get to see what he has in store for us. Okay, right? For Caleb, for Joshua, they got to see it, right? The whole generation did not, right? And I don't know if you guys can even imagine that, right? I mean, 40 years, all the people 20 years and older just died away, and, they, and God had already pronounced that judgment. And so they knew that that was going to happen, yet they still had to wander. One year for every day they explored the territory. So 40 years. And yet, none of them got to see it. But if we look at the positive side of it, Caleb and, jo- uh, Caleb and Joshua got to see it because they did follow the Lord. They were committed to him. They got to see their inheritance. Here's, what, um, here's the original promise to Caleb in Deuteronomy 1.36. And it's also loosely quoted in Joshua 14.9. It says, He, Caleb, will see it, the land, and I will give him and his descendants the land he set his feet on because he followed the Lord wholeheartedly. Okay, so he's, Caleb followed the Lord, and then he got to see what God had in store for him. If we're not willing to follow the Lord, we're not going to be able to see the things that he has in store for us. He has his life set out for us, and if we don't um, follow him with our, with our lives, we, might, we won't have that opportunity. We'll miss out. Now, I've shared before that... Um, I made a lordship decision kind of in the 90s, and then along the way, God led me to go to seminary for the first time. And so I went to Regent College uh, in Vancouver, BC, and as I've shared before also, it was one of the best decisions I ever made in my whole life, just going there. And one of, one of the things I benefited from going there was, um, you know, it broadened my um, Christian view, my, my worldview, really. And, and, but it cost me something, right? I mean, I, I said, God, you know, whatever. I mean, I had left my job. I got to go there, but it was great. It was worth it. I got to see what he had in store for me. One of the things that I did learn there was at Regent, they emphasized something we call Christian spirituality. And that's kind of just a fancy way to say connecting with God, walking with God. And, but I was new to me, a lot of the stuff. You know, I, I, I got to, I started, you know, I read Richard Foster for the first time, if you guys know who he is. I got to, you know, take a class with Eugene Peterson. And it was just this deepening of my relationship with God that I didn't really understand. I still, still, I still are working on it, but um, I still remember some of the classes. There was one class that was, the, the professor was so deep, I would fall asleep like half the time because it was so like, woo, <laughs> and, I would, and I would just, because it was so, you know, had so much depth. But, um, but I look back on that time, and it just really impacted my life, that even today, um, because, because I was willing to make that commitment to the Lord, he revealed stuff to me that impacts who I am. And I believe that he will do that for all of us. So that's secret number one. Following the Lord, following God means following him wholeheartedly. And we will get to see what he has in store for us. Okay, two. Caleb understood that trusting the Lord keeps us going. 
So trusting in the Lord will sustain us, right? Commitment, they're both related, commitment and trust, you know, they're, they're related elements. You know, if you think about maybe marriage, um, we marry somebody for a lot of reasons, uh, but one reason is we wouldn't marry someone if we didn't trust them, right? Because we trust that person, we will make a commitment to them, right? And so they, they kind of go hand in hand. And so Caleb, right, he made the commitment, but it was built on the trust, right? He trusted God. He trusted that God made him a promise, right, and that God would deliver. God would provide him that land that he said. Because if you think about it, right, Caleb had numerous reasons to be bitter, right? Would you guys be a little bit bitter if you didn't do anything wrong? These, you know, you said, hey, let's go take this land. God is with us. And the other people said no. And then now you get stuck. <laughs> you get stuck wandering around the desert for 40 years. And you have to see all these people that you know die. And I, for 40 years, I don't know how, you know how that would be for a lot of us, right? Um, and then also, before that, if you think about his life, he was a slave in Egypt for 39 years. So before, you know, before, they, before the exodus, he was a slave. I mean, if you think of being a slave at all, but for 39 years, he was a slave in Egypt, right, before God delivered them. And you would think, would you give up, right? Why would you keep going, right? You would think, man, this guy, I, wouldn't, I don't know how it would hold on. And so he had every reason to either give up or be bitter, I think, right, if we look at his life. Yet he didn't, right? And a big reason for that is he trusted God. He trusted God that God would take care of him, that God would sustain him, that God would come through. He saw that prize, right, and he held on to it. For us, you know, I think we do struggle, right, with unanswered prayer or we struggle when we have to wait, right? God can either say, you know, if we ask for something, God can say yes, he can say no, he can say maybe, he can say wait, right? And for a lot of us, it's hard, right? I mean, there's a lot of things that we go through in this world that are not easy. You know, maybe some of us have illness, you know, that's lasting, and we go, man, Lord, this, I don't, you know, I'm discouraged. Um, maybe for some of us, you know, you have a tough marriage, and you're like, man, God, I, I can't do this anymore. Or whatever it is, I mean, I'm not saying any of these things are easy, obviously not. Right? But God says we can trust him. Right? We can have confidence in him. We can hold on to him. We can hold on to his promises. And Numbers 23, 19 says this. God is not human that he should lie, not a human being that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? Right? So God says he will come through. Okay, and so for us, I mean, Caleb had this specific promise that God put in, in front of him, right? But for us, you know, what do we do? Well, man, we have the Bible, right? We have promises. I mean, if you, I don't know if you guys have a rough guess, but how many promises do you think are in the Bible? Anybody? There's that, literally thousands, okay? There's literally thousands of promises in the Bible that we can claim as God's people, right? I'm going to bring up a few a list of few. So God promises to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness if we confess and repent. God promises that he is with us, that he will give us his Holy Spirit to guide us. God promises he will give us peace that transcends understanding. God promises Jesus will come again. God promises that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. God promises to give us power God promises that we will not be tempted beyond what we can bear. God promises that Jesus' yoke is easy and his burden is light. God promises that nothing can separate us from his love. God promises us freedom from the penalty of sin and the power of sin. God makes these, you know, we can go on and on on the great promises that God gives us in Scripture, right? And so when we do need uh, to hold on to something, you know, we hold on to God and we say, God, you know, you have promised this to me. I would, I need, I'm claiming this, Lord, and he will sustain you, okay? He gives, us, he gives us his promises for a reason, right? He wants us to claim them, right? You look at Caleb. I mean, Caleb was pretty bold. He says, hey, God made me this promise. Give me, give me this land, you know, it's mine. And I think, you know, God wants us to approach it that way too, that, 
his desire for us is that we would have a life, a full life. His desire for us is that we would live into who we are in Christ. And part of that is claiming his promises. But just because God makes a promise doesn't mean it's going to be easy, right? We think, oh, okay, he promised me. But promise doesn't mean, oh, life is going to be easy for us. Or if we look at Joshua uh, 14, verse 12, so Caleb says, Now give me this hill country that the Lord promised me that day. You yourself heard then that the Anakites were there and that their cities were large and fortified. But the Lord helping me, I will drive them out just as he said. All right, so for Caleb, so if you're not familiar, the Anakites are these big, these large people, okay, strong people. They're kind of like, they're, uh, they're related to Goliath, right? And so when the Israelites saw them in the land, that was one of the reasons why they were scared. Okay, not just one Goliath, but a bunch of them, right? And, and so, but um, Caleb said, hey, I'm going to, you know, God is with me. I'm going to go. Just, get, you know, give me the land and I'll take out, I'll take out the rest of the toughest guys, right? And so um, Caleb did. He still did, right? He claimed God's promise. He still trusted in him. He took that step of faith. He wasn't deterred. And he, he wa- it seemed like he wanted to fight, you guys ever think like, oh, man, life is so tough, I'm just tired of fighting, right? I think we can do that. But for Caleb, it was like, I'm ready. He was like, he just, just, just let me go, Joshua, and I'm going to go take these guys. He was ready. And so part of it is God makes the promise, but we have to be the ones to really go after it and say, okay, God, you promised that to me. I'm going to claim it. I'm going to go after it. I'm not going to just be discouraged or... Um, sit here and think about how tough things are. I'm going to rely on you. Okay? So, I don't know, for you guys, if, uh, if you think about right now, is there something that, that you need to trust God with right now? And list of some things. I mean, life is, you know, there's a lot of things in our life that are challenging. But is there something right now that you would like to trust God with? So think about that for a second, and if you want to write it down, or pray to God about it. Is there something you need to trust God with right now? And then kind of while they, you're thinking about that thing, is there a corresponding promise? Is there a promise in Scripture that ties into that? And if you need help finding that, there's other, you can ask other people to help you um, search. You can do Bible searches for promises. But, you know, is there a promise of God that you can claim? Okay. All right, that's the second one. The third one is, Caleb understood that waiting on God is worth it. Waiting on God is worth it. Right, the land that Caleb got to take was this precious land, and, you know, he knew it too, right, because um, Hebron was where Abraham bought a field to bury his wife, Sarah, right, and then Abraham was buried there as well. Uh, traditionally, we believe Isaac was buried there, Jacob was buried there too. So for the Israelites, that was a precious, that was like a sacred area, right? If you could, you know, own that land, you would want to. And so for Caleb, he's like, not only did he have promise of God, but he's like, man, this is a great, you know, it's a great area. It's hill country. You know, there's power when you're higher up, right? You can see things. And so he he knew that that was what was in store for him, right? And he wanted that. And um, he got to do it. It was kind of like a privilege, too, right? Not only did he get this great promise, but I think he saw it as a privilege. He's like, yeah, I want to take this land for the Lord, and I get to do it, and he looked forward to it, okay? And so, uh, you know, what do we do, though, too, when God uh, makes us wait? You know, we could end up like the, the big part of the Israelites. When God made them wait, they just got, they sinned, right? And they had to pay a price. Or do we... Um, do we go for it? Right? Do we understand that what God has in store for us is worth it? Right? What God has in store for us is worth it. Because in the end, I think sometimes we don't even really know what we want. I mean, until God reveals it to us. Right? Maybe we think we want something like the fountain of youth, but God really wants to give us a relationship with him, right? this vital relationship with him. Maybe we think we want an easy life or success, but God really just wants to give us a full life. Right? God wants to give us a life that has meaning. 
Um, I was thinking about the kind of an analogy, kind of like a trip, right? If you if it go on a long trip, um, either a car ride or an airplane ride, if you have to fly overseas, you don't really look forward to the to the flying or driving part usually, right? I mean, I think flying, you get some movies, it kind of helps a little bit. But if you have to fly, we flew to Israel, and when you, you know, we had to fly, um, the first one leg was like 10 hours, and it's not easy, right? I mean, it's, you know, it's little seats. I, I sat next to uh, Eric Wong, and he can't sleep on airplanes. I can sleep, so it's not as bad for me, but he couldn't sleep, so he's sitting there awake the whole time. Um, but for him, I'm sure... Because that destination was so great, right? It's kind of like this bucket list worthy destination, right? To go to Israel. He was willing, it's not a big deal to fly, you know, sit in that airplane for 10 hours, layovers, et cetera, right? It was worth it. And so when we, when we see something is worth it, then we're willing to endure, okay? And things that God has in store for us, they're going to be worth it. So there are two two different kinds of secrets. Uh, one is the kind that few people are supposed to know, right? Maybe it's your email password, right? No one, you know, you don't want people to know that because, yeah. Um, but there's other types of secrets that aren't meant to be hidden. Actually, there are types of secrets that is more like a way, right? We use the term secret. It's kind of like the way, right? The, maybe the secret of success or something like that, right? And I think God is full of open secrets that uh, if we're willing to listen, he wants to reveal to us, right? These aren't the kind of secrets that are, uh, we have to do something, you know, work our way to earn them. It's more of this kind of this, this is the only way to get this secret kind of thing, right? That God says, hey, here's the, here's the secret, but here's the way to get there. And so the secret to a good life is to follow God wholeheartedly and being confident that he will come through. And that all the promises he ever made us will be fulfilled. I think that's the real secret that we're looking for. It's not this eternal youth thing. It's more of a full life, right? We're looking for a full life, not a long life. Uh, there's this um, famous uh, Christian speaker from the 4th century named uh, John Christostom. And they call him Golden Mouth because he was such a good speaker, right? And, but anyways, he, taught, he had a... Um, he had a belief that uh, righteousness kept us young in our spirits or in our souls, right? But also the flip side is that sin would age us in our souls, in our spirits. And I think it's kind of like that for Caleb, that he was young in, um, physically but also spiritually because he was righteous, right? He was fully committed to God, and that kept him young. And that can be the same for us, that we can be vital in our lives, in our faith, from when we first place our trust in Jesus all the way to the end, right? It's not just based on how old we are. And so I, that's the challenge, I hope, for you, all of us, is that we would be like Caleb, that we would follow the Lord wholeheartedly for a lifetime, knowing that it's worth it, knowing that we can trust him. So worship team, why don't you guys come on up? So as the worship team comes up, um, as, as normal at church, we have the prayer intercessors will be on the side, side walls uh, if you want prayer. And maybe you thought of something that you want to trust God in and you want to bring it and have it prayed over, and that would be great. But you can come for any other reason on the sides. Um, I think, you know, it's a blessing to be prayed for. It helps us. Uh, we also have, uh, as a part of our worship, our offering boxes are on the side. You could drop off your offering there too as well. So let me pray. Father God, I just uh, thank you for Caleb, that he uh, was a man after your own heart, that he wholeheartedly followed you, that it sustained him until he was, you know, 85 and beyond. He was still conquering, conquering the land. And I pray, Lord, that we can learn from him, that... Um, we can, we can be that type of person, that we can follow you wholeheartedly, that we can trust in you, that we can live um, lives with our eyes set on the goal, and that we can see that what you have is worth the wait. And so I pray for um, perseverance. I pray for um, a 
desire to follow after you. And I just pray that each one of us here would know you, love you, um, and, and walk with you all the days of our life. We thank you, Lord. Praise in Jesus' name.